8, Bolgia 3, The Simoniacs. Dante comes upon the Simoniacs, sellers of ecclesiastic favors and offices, and his heart overflows with the wrath he feels against those who corrupt the things of God. This bolgia is lined with round, tube-like holes, and the sinners are placed in them upside down, with the soles of their feet ablaze. The heat of the blaze is proportioned to their guilt. The holes in which these sinners are placed are debased equivalents of the baptismal fonts common in the cities of northern Italy and the sinner's confinement in them is temporary. As new sinners arrive, the souls drop through the bottoms of their holes and disappear eternally into the crevices of the rock. As always, the punishment is a symbolic retribution. Just as the simoniacs made a mock of holy office, so are they turned upside down in a mockery of the baptismal font. Just as they made a mockery of the holy water of baptism, so is their hellish baptism by fire, after which they are wholly immersed in the crevices below. The oily fire that licks at their souls may also suggest a travesty on the oil used in extreme unction, last rites for the dying. Virgil carries Dante down an almost sheer ledge and lets him speak to one who is the chief sinner of that place, Pope Nicholas III. Dante delivers himself of another stirring denunciation of those who have corrupted church office, and Virgil carries him back up the steep ledge toward the fourth bolgia. O oh, Simon Magus, O oh, you wretched crew who follow him, pandering for silver and gold the things of God which should be wedded to love and righteousness. O oh, thieves for hire, now must the trump of judgment sound your doom here in the third fosse of the rim of fire. We had already made our way across to the next grave and to that part of the bridge which hangs above the midpoint of the fosse. O sovereign wisdom, how thine art doth shine in heaven, on earth, and in the evil world! How justly doth thy power judge and assign! I saw along the walls and on the ground long rows of holes cut in the livid stone. All were cut to size and all were round. They seem to be exactly the same size as those in the font of my beautiful San Giovanni, built to protect the priests who come to baptize, one of which, not so long since, I broke open to rescue a boy who was wedged and drowning in it, but this enough to undeceive all men. From every mouth a sinner's legs stuck out as far as the calf. The soles were all ablaze, and the joints of the legs quivered and writhed about. Wides and tethers would have snapped in their throes, as oiled things blaze upon the surface only. So did they burn from the heels to the points of their toes. Master, I said, who is that one in the fire who writhes and quivers more than all the others? From him the ruddy flame seemed to leap higher. He said to me, if you wish me to carry you down along that lower bank, you may learn from him who he is and the evil he has done. And I, what you will, I will. You are my lord, and know I depart in nothing from your wish and you know my mind beyond my spoken word. We moved to the fourth ridge and, turning left, my guide descending to a jagged path into the straight and perforated cleft. Thus the good master bore me down the dim and rocky slope and did not put me down till we reached the one whose legs did penance for him. Whoever you are, sad spirit, I began, who lie here with your head below your heels and planted like a stake, speak if you can. I stood like a friar who gives the sacrament to a hired assassin, who, fixed in the hole, recalls him and delays his death a moment. "'Are you there already, Boniface? Are you there already?' he cried. "'By several years the writ has lied, and all that gold and all that care, are you already sated with the treasure for which you dared to turn on the sweet lady and trick and pluck and bleed her at your pleasure?' I stood like one caught in some raillery, not understanding what is said to him, lost for an answer to such mockery. Then Virgil said, Say to him, I am not he, I am not who you think. And I replied as my good master had instructed me. The sinner's feet jerked madly. Then again his voice rose, this time choked with sighs and tears, and said at last, What do you want of me then? If to know who I am drives you so fearfully that you descend the bank to ask it, know that the great mantle was once hung upon me, and in truth I was a son of the she-bear, so sly and eager to push my whelps ahead that I pursued wealth above and myself here. 
Beneath my head are dragged all who have gone before me in buying and selling holy office. There they cower in fissures of the stone. I too shall be plunged down when that great cheat for whom I took you comes here in his turn. Longer already have I baked my feet and been planted upside down. than he shall be before the West sends down a lawless shepherd of uglier deeds to cover him and me. He will be a new Jason of the Maccabees. And just as that king bent to his high priest's will, so shall the French king do as this one please. Maybe, I cannot say. I grew too brash at this point, for when he had finished speaking, I said, Indeed, now tell me how much cash our lord required of Peter, in guarantee before he put the keys into his keeping. Surely he asked nothing but follow me. Nor did Peter, nor the others, ask silver or gold of Matthew, when they chose him for the place the despicable and damned apostle sold. Therefore stay as you are. This whole well fits you. And keep a good guard on the ill-won wealth that once made you so bold toward Charles of Anjou. And were it not that I am still constrained by the reverence I owe to the great keys you held in life, I should not have refrained from using other words and sharper still, for this avarice of yours grieves all the world, tramples the virtuous, and exalts the evil. Of such as you was the evangelist's vision when he saw she who sits upon the waters, locked with the kings of earth in fornication. She was born with seven heads and ten enormous and shining horns, strengthened and made her glad as long as love and virtue pleased her spouse. Gold and silver are the gods you adore. In what are you different from the idolater? Say that he worships one and you a score. Ah, Constantine, what evil marked the hour, not of your conversion, but of the fee the first rich father took from you in dower? And as I sang in this tune, he began to twitch and kick both feet out wildly, as if in rage or gnawed by conscience, little matter which. And I think, indeed, it pleased my guide. His look was all approval, as he stood beside me, intent upon each word of truth I spoke. He approached, and with both arms he lifted me and when he had gathered me against his breast, remounted the rocky path out of the valley, nor did he tire of holding me clasped to him, until we reached the topmost point of the arch, which crosses from the fourth to the fifth rim of the pits of woe. Arrived upon the bridge, he tenderly set down the heavy burden he had been pleased to carry up that ledge, which would have been hard climbing for a goat. Here I looked down on still another boat. Notes. Simon Magus. Simon the Sumerian magician in Acts chapter 8, from whom the word simony derives. Upon his conversion to Christianity, he offered to buy the power to administer the Holy Ghost and was severely rebuked by Peter. Line 8, the next grave, means the next bolgia. Line 9, that part of the bridge, is the center point. The center of each span is obviously the best observation point. Line 11, evil world is hell. Lines 17 and 18, the font of my beautiful San Giovanni. It was the custom in Dante's time to baptize only on Holy Saturday and on Pentecost. These occasions were naturally thronged, therefore, and to protect the priests, a special font was built in the baptistry of San Giovanni with marble stands for the priests, who were thus protected from both the crowds and the water in which they immersed those to be baptized. The baptistry is still standing, but the font is no longer in it. A similar font still exists, however, in the baptistry at Pisa. 19 through 21. In these lines, Dante is replying to a charge of sacrilege that had been rumored against him. One day, a boy playing in the baptismal font became jammed in the marble tube and could not be extricated. To save the boy from drowning, Dante took it upon himself to smash the tube. This is his answer to all men on the charge of sacrilege. Line 29, more than all the others. The fire is proportioned to the guilt of the sinner. These are obviously the feet of the chief sinner of this bolgia. In a moment we shall discover that he is Pope Nicholas III. 46 to 47, like a friar, etc. Persons convicted of murdering for hire were sometimes executed by being buried alive upside down. If the friar were called back at the last moment, he should have to bend over the hole in which the man is fixed upside down, awaiting the first shovel full of earth. Pope Nicholas III, Giovanni Gatteno degli Orsini, Pope from 1277 to 1280, 
His presence here is self-explanatory. He is awaiting the arrival of his successor, Boniface VIII, who will take his place in the stone tube and who will in turn be replaced by Clement V, a pope even more corrupt than Boniface. With the foresight of the damned, he had read the date of Boniface's death, 1303, in the Book of Fate, mistaking Dante for Boniface. He thinks his foresight has erred by three years, since it is now 1300. 66, the Great Mantle is referring to the papacy. Line 67, son of the she-bear, Nicholas's family name, Daly Orsini, means in Italian, of the bear cubs. 69, pursed, a play on the second meaning of bolgia, purse. Just as I put wealth in my purse when alive, so am I put in this foul purse now that I am dead. 77 to 79, a lawless shepherd, Jason of the Maccabees, the French king. The reference is to Clement V, pope from 1305 to 1314. He came from Gascony, the west, and was involved in many intrigues with the king of France. It was Clement V who moved the papal see to Avignon, where it remained until 1377. He is compared to Jason, who bought an appointment as high priest of the Jews from King Antiochus, and thereupon introduced pagan and venal practices into the office in much of the same way as Clement used his influence with Philip of France to secure and corrupt his high office. Clement will succeed Boniface in hell because Boniface's successor, Benedictus the Tenth, the Eleventh, was a good and holy man. The terms each guilty pope must serve in this hellish baptism are Nicholas the Third, twelve eighty to thirteen o three. Four good popes intervene. Bonus, Boniface the Eighth, thirteen o three to thirteen fourteen. One good pope intervenes. Clement the Fifth, thirteen fourteen to not stated. 88 to 89, lines 88 to 89, nor did Peter of Matthias. Upon the expulsion of Judas from the band of apostles, Matthias was chosen in his place. 993, Charles of Anjou. The seventh son of Louis the Eighth of France, Charles became king of Naples and of Sicily, largely through the good offices of Pope Urban IV and later of Clement IV. Nicholas III withdrew the high favor his predecessors had shown Charles, but the exact nature and extent of his opposition are open to dispute. The exact uh, Dante probably believed, as did many of his contemporaries, that Nicholas instigated the massacre called the Sicilian Vespers, in which the Sicilians overthrew the rule of Charles and held a general slaughter of the French, who had been their masters. The Sicilian Vespers, however, was a popular and spontaneous uprising, and it did not occur until Nicholas had been dead for two years. Dante may have erred in interpreting the Sicilian question, but his point is indisputably clear when he laments the fact that simoniacally acquired wealth had involved the papacy in war and political intrigue, thereby perverting it from its spiritual purpose. Line 95, the Great Keys, refers to the papacy. 100 to 105, the Evangelist, She Who Sits Upon the Waters. St. John the Evangelist, his vision of She Who Sits Upon the Waters is set forth in Revelation, the 17th chapter. The Evangelist intended it as a vision of pagan Rome, but Dante interprets it as a vision of the Roman Church in its simoniacal corruption. The seven heads are the seven sacraments, the ten horns, the ten commandments. 109 to 111. Ah, Constantine, etc. The first rich father was Sylvester, Pope from 1314 to 355. 314 to 355. Before him, the popes possessed nothing, but when Constantine was converted and Catholicism became the official religion of the empire, the church began to acquire wealth. Dante and the scholars of his time believed, according to a document called The Donation of Constantine, that the emperor had moved his empire to the east in order to leave sovereignty of the west to the church. The document was not shown to be a forgery until the 15th century. Knowledge of the forgery would not, however, have altered Dante's view. He was unwavering in his belief that wealth was the greatest disaster that had befallen the church, for in wealth lay the root of the corruption which Dante denounced so passionately.